welcome to the stage, Megan Hoffman. Hello. Oh, there we go. I love 3D printing. This is what my first 3D printer looked like. It's about the size of a refrigerator. And I saw it my first year in high school. I went to a really good engineering program and during my tour, they're showing this thing off and the engineering teacher's like, it can make anything. So I go home to my mom and I'm like, mom, they have a Star Trek replicator at school. Not quite. A few years later, I saw this kind of picture come up in my news feed where people were 3D printing superhero hands in their garages for children without arms. And I'm like, this is it. This is what 3D printing was meant for, and this is what I'm gonna do. And at the same time, I met Wilbur. Wilbur's nine years old. He's like every other nine-year-old in the world. Um, and I'm thinking, he needs a superhero arm. But he had something else in mind. He insisted that he didn't need this arm. He didn't need something that was gonna break uh, after a few days on the playground, and he was right. I've got one right here that I made about a year ago. It's been sitting on my boss's desk for a year, and it's broken, so I can't imagine it would have survived any time with a nine-year-old. So now I'm devastated. What do I do? Uh, he doesn't want this arm, but I, I was really dedicated to this. So I decided to go out and figure out what are people doing with 3D printing and how can I use it to help Wilbur. And so I start this journey and I start to think about my own peculiar history with the healthcare system. So I faint. Uh, sometimes I just plop down on the ground. 15 seconds later, I'm back up again like nothing happened. And I've gone through so many doctors trying to figure this out. Every test in the book, and they have no idea why. My best experiences with this are when a doctor comes in and is really engaged with me to try and figure out who I am, what I need, and understand the problem. And I had this doctor once who was trying to figure out what exactly did I mean by fainting? Do I just get dizzy and kind of fall to the ground, or do I just like go out? And so she pulls up this image on YouTube of a fainting goat, and she's like, you mean like that? <laughs> Turns out, yep, I'm a fainting goat. <laughs> and so a little bit, uh, so I'm really thinking about communication, right? She uses this YouTube video to really get down to what I meant by fainting. And then I saw this again when I was interviewing a doctor who was working with a father and a daughter. And the daughter had a tumor on her heart not cancerous, benign, completely safe, but really integrated into her heart. And she's showing the father all of these different images with this big black dot, and he's like, you gotta cut it out. You have to get that out. But she's insisting, no, that surgery is far more dangerous than this tumor. He doesn't believe her. Until she 3D prints a model of that heart. He's able to hold his daughter's heart in his hand and look at it and then can talk it through, explain what the surgery would be like, explain what's going on, and he finally settles on, no, we don't need to do this surgery. And I'm happy to report that the little girl is now a fully functional adult with no heart problems. It was really important that they were able to use this piece of technology to communicate with one another and explain what's going on. In my experience, the real stealth innovators of healthcare are nurses. And the first person you meet when you go in the door and they spend the most time with you solving kind of the day-to-day -day challenges in a healthcare system. This is my favorite nurse. Her name is Anna Young and she started a startup called Maker Nurse. And Maker Nurse gives 3D printers to nurses and hospitals and clinics all around the world in the hopes that they'll be able to take their innovations, their day-to-day -day innovations and share them with the world. Anna, Anna Young knows that if you give a nurse a 3D printer, she'll make a test tube rack that she can hook onto her scrubs so that she can really focus on the patient and just pull out whatever vial she needs when she needs it. Or she, they'll make a 
uh, pill case for a visually impaired patient so that that patient can use their medications without the help of the nurse. 3D printing is really transforming the world of healthcare. Uh, and particularly, it's transforming it in low resource regions. So back in 2010, there was a devastating earthquake in Haiti. And in the capital of Port-au-Prince, over 1,000 people lost their limbs. So volunteers from all around the world flocked to Port-au-Prince. And they brought 3D printers with them in the hopes of taking these superhero arms, adjusting them, and giving them to the people there. And they were really thoughtful about how they changed the design. They made sure that they matched people's skin tones. They made sure that they looked a little more lifelike and that they were comfortable. But the problem was that as soon as they started tracking some of these designs, they found people weren't actually using them. So one volunteer went to a woman who wasn't using her prosthetic and said, what's wrong? Does it not fit? Is it uncomfortable? Why aren't you wearing it? And the woman says, no, it's an amazing piece of technology. It's life changing. But it looks expensive. And it turns out that when you're on the streets of Port-au-Prince and you're begging for money, people don't give you things if you're wearing an expensive piece of technology. So they started to spend a little more time with her and come up with a solution that had nothing to do with 3D printing. They helped her build up a business plan so that she could start selling juice drinks on the streets. And now that's providing enough money to feed her family and to enroll her kids in school. It's really important that this technology has nothing to do, or that the solution has nothing to do with the technology. If they had started off by saying, what do you need and how can we help? I think they would have gotten to that solution faster. But sometimes technology is the right answer and you find it along the way. This is Dr. Tarek Lubani. Uh, he's an emergency doctor in Gaza. And during 2012, he was serving during an invasion. And in his hospital, there were only two stethoscopes for over 100 doctors. So every time he had to treat a patient and listen to their heartbeat, he had to press his head up against their chest to figure it out. He didn't think this was acceptable. And so he said, all right, I'm going to solve this problem. I'm going to get more stethoscopes into this hospital. So he tried to import them. But you can't import very many medical devices because of the Israeli blockade. And so you have to make things there yourself. He had a 3D printer, and he decided, I'm going to 3D print a stethoscope. And so he started out to design one, and he made one that was 3D printable, affordable, and just as good as the commercially available kind. And with all of this success, he decided to found an organization called GLIA, which works with engineers and Palestinian doctors in the area to try and make more 3D printed medical devices. This is their most recent uh, project. They're working on designing tourniquets for emergency situations. I got one on my arm right here. Uh, and that, basically what these are used for is to stop the flow of blood. And they can actually import these from the military. But the military models are for people with big, strong muscles, but not for civilians or children. And so instead, they decided to make an adjustable model that would accommodate all bodies in those situations. What's really great about what they're doing there is that they start out by understanding a problem and a community and the context it exists in. And they just happened to find this amazing technology. And so with all of those things that I learned about how we can communicate and innovate and how to start with a problem, I go back to Wilbur. So I asked him, what's his problem? What did he want help with? And he wanted help playing the cello. He'd been playing it for a few years at this point. And every time he wanted to play the cello, his mom or his music teacher had to strap it onto his arm and duct tape it all together. That wasn't really working out for him. He wanted something sleek that he could put on and off on his own and throw in the cello case when he was done. So we get to work. We start prototyping and figuring out exactly what we need to make for him. And, and we realize that there's this challenge. How long does this need to be? So we start stacking Legos between the end of his arm and the cello bow, and something breaks. Things always break in research. And so I'm sitting there trying to duct tape this all together and make it go, and he starts playing with the Legos. He starts stacking them up on top of his arm, and I ask him what he's, what he's building, and he says, a ketchup factory. He had been on a field trip to a ketchup factory the week before. He was really excited by this. And he starts to play and laugh with me. He's really engaging. I get to ask him more questions. He's a little more upfront about his needs. 
And we finally come up with a solution just in time for his recital. What was really great about working with Wilbur was not that I was able to solve this problem for him, but it was about what he taught me. He taught me a few things as a researcher about how to prototype, use a 3D printer, and work on something. But the more important lesson was for me as a patient. See, Wilbur was braver than I had ever been. He told me what he needed. He explained why what I was trying to give him wasn't going to solve that problem. And he really put me in my place as a researcher. If there are any medical professionals out in the room, I want you to think about collaborating with your patients and trying to solve the problems together and think about how you can work with them instead of working for them. And to all of us, I think it's really important to remember that we are the world's leading experts in our own needs. I envision a world where Everyone has the power to change their health care as if it were as easy as clicking print. Thank you so much, Glasgow. I hope you have a wonderful evening.